Hello and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Isaac Sorts, and I'm the National Architectural Sales Manager with WR Meadows, based in the Northeast. And again, thank you for joining us for our free monthly public AIA continuing education session. So today's presentation is blindside waterproofing. Our presenter today is Ms. Taylor Carter. Taylor is our Orlando-based dedicated architectural rep, servicing a large territory for WR Meadows of Georgia in the Southeast region of the US. And before I pass the presentation over to Taylor, I wanna go through a couple of things together. So just a little housekeeping info before we get started. Everyone's gonna be muted for the duration of the presentation. Uh, if you have questions, please type your questions into the Q&A box. That's the Q&A box and double check that you're addressing your questions to quote all panelists. Uh, we will be monitoring the Q&A and we'll be attempting to answer your questions in real time. If your question requires a lengthier explanation or maybe it's a bit more complex, um, we may hold on to it until the end of the presentation to possibly answer verbally, or we may just get in touch with you afterward via email for a longer explanation. So this is an AIA accredited presentation. Everyone will be receiving certificates sent to the email address you provided to us at registration. And if you included your AIA number, we will also be submitting these credits directly to the AIA for you. And lastly, if you would like a copy of the presentation or you'd like to get in touch with your local rep or you have questions for us at WR Meadows, um, Anything you could possibly uh, request from us, please shoot us an email to info at wrmeadows.com. That's info at wrmeadows.com. We look forward to answering your questions. And at this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Taylor. Thank you, Isaac. Hi everyone, my name is Taylor Carter, um, as Isaac just introduced me, and I am the Florida Architectural Rep here in Florida. Um, I have been in this industry for about eight years, and I am excited to teach you guys about blindside waterproofing. Um, this is actually a pretty interesting presentation, so I hope you guys enjoy it, and we're going to go ahead and get to it. So before we start the actual AIA, I'd like to go ahead and go over who our company is and what we do. So let's see. Oh, my presentation did not want to move. There we go. Um, so we are, WR Meadows is a family owned and operated company. We first began in 1926 out of Elgin, Illinois. Um, if you don't know where Elgin, Illinois is, that's about 45 minutes out from Chicago. We continued growth throughout North America, including 13 facilities, three of those being in Canada. That's going to be including our manufacturing as well as our warehouses. If you take a look on this map here, you're going to see the yellow is going to be our manufacturing facilities. The gray is going to be the warehouses. Um, obviously, like I said, I'm located in Orlando, so we've got a warehouse right there in Orlando. And then about 500 miles north. In Cartersville, Georgia, we have a manufacturing facility. So it's really nice to see kind of what you're looking at for lead times, you know, having the stuff manufactured in the United States uh, as well as Canada. In the Meadows family of products, uh, we actually specialize in building envelope, which is going to be your air barriers and waterproofing. But we also have your joint sealants, concrete restoration, expansion joint materials. Uh, we are also in ownership with Blue Ridge Fiber Board, so that's going to be your soundproofing and insulation board. We recently acquired uh, Gemite products. That's going to be all of your cementitious waterproofing that's going to be involved with water treatment plants, sewage systems, anything that you're going to have a ton of water and sometimes water contaminants. And then we also have Deco Seal, which is going to be all of your pool sealants and pool applications. What's really nice about our products is we have 350 products spanning across five different architectural divisions. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. As Isaac said, this is gonna be worth one AIA credit. 
Um, we will make sure that this is these credits are sent out to you at the end of the presentation within a couple of days. And let's go ahead and get started. So what are we going to be learning today? We would like to understand the fundamentals of why below grade waterproofing is essential in the types of waterproofing that are available to you. We want to examine blindside and underslab waterproofing, as well as explore when blindside waterproofing is a waterproofing solution. We want to analyze the materials used in blindside waterproofing membranes. And finally, review the reasons why surface preparation is so important. We would also like to review the basic practices of insulation techniques for a blindside waterproofing system. So what exactly is blindside versus traditional waterproofing? Blindside waterproofing is actually a newer approach to below grade waterproofing on job sites where traditional waterproofing is not possible. So traditional waterproofing, which can also be called open cut, uh, this is where the foundation wall is poured and the concrete is given ample time to cure prior to waterproofing with post-applied products, which is a pre-applied system. Blindside is where a soil retention system is required to keep the soil out of the hole. And this could be the use of wood lagging, casing walls, shock free walls, et cetera. Um, when we are installing waterproofing onto the soil retention system, we pour the foundation wall up against the blindside waterproofing membrane. So blindside systems are used on a job site where the foundation is often below the water table or under a great deal of hydrostatic pressure. Uh, if you don't know what hydrostatic pressure is, that's going to be the height, weight, and the density of water pressing up against the structure. And the greater the height, weight, and density, the greater the pressure. So water in liquid form will always be looking for a crack or an area to leak its way in. Blindside waterproofing, blindside waterproofing is also a solution for zero lot lines and sites with limited access to the outer portion of the walls that are being built. So it's important to understand which materials and techniques to use in blindside waterproofing applications to ensure a long lasting waterproofing system. So there's a number of different ways to go about waterproofing a structure as mentioned earlier. We have traditional where we can access the outside or the positive side of the structure. We also have the negative side, uh, which is typically for addressing antiquated structures without a positive side system or without access to the positive side. Then we also have the integral where we add crystalline waterproofing to the mix and then supplement with both positive and negative side waterproofing systems as needed to detail it. All of these systems we're gonna discuss in greater detail throughout this presentation. But the fundamental question is, why is waterproofing so important? Moisture is your answer. Moisture is the reason why there are so many different types of waterproofing products on the market. Excessive moisture can cause significant damage to the foundation wall or lower level interior spaces. So when the below grade portion of the building is not properly addressed with waterproofing systems, negative effects can take place quickly. Negative effects can be addressed by interior waterproofing, but this does not stop the external damage or the water pressure negatively affecting the wall and the floor substrate. Sometimes installing an external drain or grading soil away from the building can actually help, but these, these are not always options depending on the building location. So if you ask any manufacturer, it's always best to waterproof on the positive side, uh, basically the side where the water is coming from. Why not just prevent it from getting in in the first place? So why do we waterproof our structures? Why is it so necessary? My answer for that is capillary action. Capillary action is the ability of liquid to flow in narrow spaces without the assistance of or the opposition to forces like gravity. So concrete is obviously very porous and it acts as a sponge and a reservoir for to absorb water and move water into the interior. So if the structure is unprotected, Liquid water can also move through cracks expect, and expect, that expectedly occur in the concrete over time. You know, you also have rainwater, irrigation systems, uh, drainage from surrounding sites. These are all sources of liquid water that we need to consider when we're addressing our design. In addition, the height of the water table can change during the year. So while it depends on the climate, the water table is typically its highest in the spring and the lowest in the fall. So moisture can enter the structure through both the vertical structural wall and the horizontal structural slab. So anticipating, you know, where the water is going to be coming from, you need to make sure that this is all continuous and make sure that your water is not finding any way to get inside the structure. But why do we care if liquid water enters our structure? 
If the building envelope is exposed to liquid water over time, the erosion of the concrete and the corrosion of the rebar can occur. So in northern climates, although we don't deal with this in Florida, in, nor in northern climates, we actually have to freeze thaw damage. And basically, that's where water is absorbed into the concrete. Um, it freezes, creates pressure to the pores of the concrete. And then you can create cracking, scaling, and crumbling of the concrete. And when this process is repeated, it can cause significant structural damage. So an unprotected structure may allow for liquid water to enter the interior occupied space and unwanted moisture in the interior can lead to health concerns like mortar mildew. Um, liquid water is also flowing to the interior space and it becomes uninhabitable for the occupants. So when we're addressing the problem, um, dense urban environments are usually where blindside waterproofing systems typically will be called for. These buildings have more floors below grade than ever before, which makes waterproofing very difficult. In urban areas where buildings are located close to one another, these urban structures can have multi-level parking garages, meeting spaces that are below grade, finished basements that are below grade in a home, and many of our structures accommodate living and habitable space below grade. So the deeper the foundation, the higher chance for water, for water to cause damage. The water protection system needs to happen on the outside of, of the positive side, but in the urban environment, that becomes difficult because of the zero lot lines. So now we're gonna go over the different types of effective waterproofing that you can use for these situations. When we're choosing effective waterproofing, it's important that the three main objectives are hit with this waterproofing. And that's gonna be one, to withstand hydrostatic pressure, two, to be able to bridge cracks that occur naturally in the concrete, and three, to prevent vapor from entering the walls and the floor. So hydrostatic pressure is the constant force of water pressure, like I said, that's going up against the building within the ground below grade. Um, and, and from standing on the moving water. So water weighs 60 pounds per cubic foot. And during heavy rains, the ground can become saturated with it. So imagine thousands of pounds of pressure pushing up against that wall constantly. Even a well-constructed foundation wall can suffer water damage under those conditions. So what we understand about vapor is that it will naturally move from an area of high vapor pressure to an area of low vapor pressure in the soil, independent of air pressure, and based on the difference in temperature and relative humidity. So the temperature of the earth below grade is 55 degrees at all time. So what is our RH? It's actually 100% relative humidity at all times. So if we know that the water vapor is moving independent of air pressure and based on the difference in relative humidity and the temperature, we can assume that many times of the year without a vapor barrier, we will have a natural vapor drive from the soil through the concrete into our structures. The water control system of the building goes beyond the membrane. Water control should be addressed on all six sides of the building, above and below grade. What is done above grade contributes to the effectiveness of our below grade system. So first we would start with deflection. Deflection is the first line of defense. Deflecting as much water as possible away from the building as quickly as possible will lower the load that the water protection systems have to withstand. This can be done through the use of overhangs, eaves, gutters, and et cetera. Um, and basically the whole idea is to push that water away from the building so that we can just try to minimize how much water is pushing up against that wall. You also wanna consider the protection. There will be significant water that is not deflected. Therefore, the structure must be further protected. Above grade, the water protection system includes the cladding and the water resistant air barrier. And then below grade, we have the water protection system that may include damp proofing or a true waterproofing membrane. You also wanna incorporate drainage. Um, this will prevent the buildup of hydrostatic pressure. Drainage is required to move liquid water down the exterior of the building away from the foundation. And the more opportunity those membrane, the longer the foundation is exposed to hydrostatic pressure, the more opportunity these membranes have to fail. So the drainage system includes drainage mats or drainage boards, which then move the water down the base of the structure. And then once it's down there, the draining board then tie into a French drain or another foundational drainage system to move the water far away from the structure. So choosing a waterproofing system, 
Um, again, you want to consider the positive side, negative side, and the internal waterproofing. The positive side systems place the protective membrane on the most exterior side of the structural wall or the wet side of the wall. The negative side systems place the waterproofing membrane on the interior side or the structural wall or dry side. Then the integral integral wall, excuse me, waterproofing system incorporate the waterproofing mechanism inside the concrete mix itself. No matter which system is used, all of these have common characteristics that make them effective for waterproofing a structure. The primary characteristic of waterproofing it's the resistance to hydrostatic pressure. So if the material is not resistant to hydrostatic pressure, by definition, it's actually not considered a waterproofing membrane. A product that is resistant to water but not under hydrostatic pressure is actually categorized as a damp proofing material. Damp proofing is only acceptable by code in very dry climates or where there's no hydrostatic pressure or buildup of liquid water. So always verify local code requirements to see if damp proofing is an appropriate situation for your location. Most commercial applications are going to require a true waterproofing membrane. So no matter how robust a system is, if there is drainage to the membrane and untreated penetration or an open seam, water will exploit the weak point and the membrane must be continuous. So all membranes must be able to withstand the typical job site stress and environmental exposure. Um, so by covering up the waterproofing system quickly, the less exposure and abuse that they will receive. You also want to consider prevention. Um, this is a lot easier than having to go back and patch up the system. So a strong, flexible membrane won't damage as easily and less will have to be repaired. In addition, waterproofing is not a maintenance-friendly system. So once the concrete is poured, the soil backfilled, it is actually very difficult to access the positive side of these systems for repair. If damage does occur during the backfill on the concrete pour, um, it is expensive remedial waterproofing may be necessary. And also these membranes must be the last, must last the entire life of the building um, and not degrade over time. So the water, the waterproof membrane must be able to accommodate movement because soil is going to shift and concrete is going to crack. So the system must continue to protect the structure even after this movement occurs. But let's focus more on the positive side. So the positive side waterproofing occurs on the outside or the same side as the water source, which is what we call the wet side. It's often used in new construction, and it is considered the best option when possible because it actually protects the structure from potential water damage um, before the water even has a chance to penetrate the building. Positive side provides free stall protection and protects the concrete against corrosive elements in the groundwater and the soil contaminants. Some of those corrosive elements in the water consist of bicarb bicarbonate, calcium, magnesium, nitrate, sodium, phosphate, you know, all those different types of chemicals. And in abnormal levels, such as a uh, soil report, can actually determine, you know, what chemicals are going to be there and where it's going to be located. Um, can actually play a big part in that too. You know, if it's in an industrial or agriculture, a waste disposal, any kind of place like that, you're going to have toxic chemicals in the water that cannot be filtered out through the ground. And depending on the material and the, chem the chemicals that are present, so you will need a phase two soil report so that this can assist in picking materials that are up to the task of resisting those chemicals. The disadvantages to a positive side waterproofing is if you do need to do make a repair, uh, the process is difficult and expensive. So during construction, positive side waterproofing relies extra attention from the project team to make sure that you wouldn't have to do that. Now with negative waterproofing, this refers to placing the waterproofing membrane in the interior side of the wall which is considered the dry side. This method is typically used if there is no access to the external or positive side of the wall. So if, for an example, you have existing concrete with elevator pits or remedial waterproofing due to a failure of new construction, negative side waterproofing is easier to pass or correct if an issue arises. However, it is limited in what it actually protects. So negative side waterproofing prevents liquid water from entering occupied space, but it doesn't protect the structure. Liquid water and soil contaminants can still penetrate the structure, which can erode the concrete and potentially corrode the structural steel. In addition, negative side waterproofing also does not protect against the free stall damage that we have up north. So down south, free stall is you know, obviously not much of an issue, but in the northern climates, it can cause serious damage because the, as, as it freezes, the water actually expands, turns small cracks into slightly larger cracks. Then the ice melts and the process begins all over again. And then once 
these insignificant cracks have now become serious structural issues. So when we're choosing a waterproofing system for the integral, um, this is going to be with the addition of adding to the concrete mixture. Um, the integral waterproofing essentially turns the concrete itself into a water barrier. So standard concrete is very porous. By adding crystalline admixture, a reaction to the free line creates more crystallization than standard concrete, which fills up you know, all the pores. Unfortunately, when the concrete cracks, so does the waterproofing. So some crystalline material can self-seal very small cracks because the water will jump the chemical reaction to make calcium silicate hydrate or CSH crystals again. But if the cracks are larger, the remedial waterproofing may be necessary. Um, the surface penetrations and openings in the envelope are not addressed with integral waterproofing, so that will be have to, that will have to be carefully detailed as well. So when choosing a waterproofing material, both blindside and traditional fall under the positive side waterproofing category. Um, in both cases, the waterproofing is on the most exterior side of the substrate, and in a completed foundational wall, each material ends up in the same order: drainage board, waterproofing membrane structural wall, but the order of installation could be different. So in traditional waterproofing, the site is over excavated, then the foundational or structural concrete is poured, the concrete wall is pure, and then the waterproofing membrane is applied to the structural concrete. So traditional waterproofing is also referred to as post-applied waterproofing. In a blind site application, the site is excavated only to the footprint of the structure, a soil retention system is installed, and then a drainage board or a protection force is applied directly against the soil retention system. The waterproofing membrane is attached to the protection force, and then the rebar is placed. Finally, the concrete is poured. Excuse me, finally, the, the concrete is poured against the waterproofing membrane. And then the blindside waterproofing is also referred to as pre-applied waterproofing or an open cut waterproofing. So the blindside waterproofing method has been around for a very long time in various forms since the early 1900s, and its rise in popularity is due to primarily the rapid growth of urban environments. Frequently, surface parking lots or small on-grade structures are developed into high-rise office towers with existing structures on multiple sides. So the new structure may fall for several floors of below-grade parking, but over-excavation is, is impossible. So the construction of the new structure must be contained with zero lot lines, Therefore, the blind side is the only option. Um, any situation where over excavation is impossible or cost prohibitive may require a blind side installation, like construction on a hill or bedrock, um, construction inside the water table, or construction in a sensitive ecosystem or brownfield site. So, according to the manual of below grade waterproofing systems by Justin Herschel, there are six criteria to evaluate the site's waterproofing needs. As buildings are constructed closer together and with stricter code requirements, site access can be considered a seventh criteria. So once positive side waterproofing is selected as the best option, restricted site access may, be, may cause blindside waterproofing to be the only solution to protect against that water infiltration. When reviewing the final installation of an over excavated site, and blindside application, the components of the waterproofing system actually end up in the same place. So the drainage board or protection force is the most exterior, and then the waterproofing membrane is installed, then the structural concrete. However, the blindside installation of these components occurs in reverse order compared to a traditional waterproofing application. So in a traditional application, the site is cleared first, and then the walls are poured, and then the waterproofing and drainage plane is installed against the, the foundational wall. Then after the waterproofing system is installed, the site is backfilled. In a blind site application, a soil retention system is installed first, held in place by tiebacks. Then the drainage board or the protection force is installed, followed by the waterproofing membrane. And then finally, the rebar is placed and the structural concrete is poured. So now we're going to talk about the soil retention systems, because um, these are also a very, a very important aspect to the waterproofing system itself. Um, there are many commonly used soil retention systems, including wood lagging, sheet piling, soldier piling, slurry, chalk free. Uh, but the most important thing to, rem to remember is that no matter what system you use, 
is that the soil retention is smooth and continuous. Another thing to remember about these soil retention systems is that they are designed to be temporary. Um, they are designed to hold up the drainage board and to hold up the waterproofing membrane until the concrete is poured. So once it is poured, the ultimate goal is that the, those membranes bond with the concrete and the retention system probably is going to degrade or shift over time. So I wanna note that you can see um, the waterproofing is going, waterproofing is literally going on the bottom, usually going on the bottom below the slab and then going up the walls. And it's a pretty typical application like this because we're actually protecting the vertical walls against hydrostatic pressure when there's probably a lot of groundwater. So we need to anticipate that we need to protect underslope as well. And it doesn't always happen like that. There's a lot of different variations based on soil conditions and things of that matter. For, uh, for a specific application like a bathtub, uh, what, we can, what we consider bathtubbing a site, because we're actually waterproofing both the base as the horizontal and then also the vertical upright. Um, surface preparation of the soil retention, this must be smooth and continuous at all times. Um, the soil retention needs to be filled if they're larger, the gaps inside the soil retention actually need to be filled if they're larger than two inches. This can be done with plywood or concrete. Sometimes it could be foam, but we're not a huge fan of foam because that, that's actually, when the concrete is poured, it's going to push on the more flexible membrane into the void and create protrusions. Um, so as the soil retention actually degrades or shifts, those protrusions become more vulnerable. Drainage boards can help cover the small gaps so we don't have to fill in every little space in between the plywood because the drainage board is going to create that smooth surface most of the time. If you're using a slurry or a shotcrete, you must grind down any sharp points for that same exact reason. When the concrete is poured, it's going to push up against that membrane and the soil retention system. So if there are any sharp points, they could potentially puncture the membrane. And then at that point, we don't know that the membrane is punctured, punctured or where it's going to be punctured. Um, we're not going to actually know that there's an issue until we have water flowing into our building. So if you're using shock free to slurry, you want to make sure that it's as smooth as possible. Now, back into the drainage systems, um, there's two things I want to go over with this. We want water to go down the drainage system as quickly as possible, and we want to move that water away from our membrane and pre prevent any buildup of hydrostatic pressure. These drainage boards are usually composite boards, and they're made of a couple different materials, including a soil filter, excuse me, a soil filter fabric, and that will keep all the soil from getting into the drainage board so that it doesn't clog. It also has this very specific profile for water to flow through so that it's free flowing all the way from the base until it ties into whatever the drainage system is at the foundation, whether that's a pump or a fringe drain or any other design drainage system. There's different size drainage systems for different applications. So if we're only going one story below grade, we're not going to need as much flow capacity as if we were going three or four stories below grade because the opportunity for water to build up is greater the deeper that we go into the earth. Now, if you're building inside the water table, then your drainage mat actually isn't going to do much in terms of drainage. It might still protect the membrane against that shifting soil. And as the soil retention system degrades, but if we're sitting in the table, the water table, we're still going to get that hydrostatic pressure. So we may use a different type of protection course, or if we're using bed night product, which we haven't really talked about yet, but you'll find out shortly that those products actually need hydration to work effectively. So if we don't want to prevent water from getting to those types of systems, because it's part of the system characteristic that help it work best. So we're gonna go ahead and get into the different types of waterproofing that, that are offered out, into, out in the industry. Um, we have our sheet applied that are typically made out of some sort of bituminous material, like a polymer modified asphalt. And then they're put with some sort of laminated plastic facer that will help with the durability, like an HDPE PVC. That's a tongue twister. <laughs> um, or maybe a butanol rubber TPO. Uh, there are many different types of products out there that will help make them more durable depending on the manufacturer. But they also have a lot of proprietary materials that are involved with these sheet materials, as well as geotextile adhesives and that sort of thing. Um, a little more on the sheet waterproofing. There are two different ways to do this. You can either have a mechanical bond where a geotextile becomes physically embedded into the concrete to create a mechanical bond. Or there are products out there that have a chemical adhesion, kind of like an adhesive that will bond to the concrete. 
They do require skilled labor to install, but I would argue that all blindside membranes require a skilled labor proper to detailing at the seams because that's the weak point where the overlap actually meets. Um, so one of the benefits to this is that it's a uniform thickness. So we're not depending on the applicator to make sure that there's enough membrane to do this job correctly. Um, there's many different options for sheet applied membranes. Sealing the seams is extremely important. Um, the seams are the weak points of the sheet membranes. So we need to make sure that they are protected and sealed to keep the water out. There are different ways of doing this. Some systems require a tape and then that tape is rolled to create a very strong bond. We also have heat fusing, which is where we essentially melt the two together to create one membrane. And then there is self sealing factory edges. This is where the adhesive on the factory edge during the overlap and all of those seams need to be rolled. However, if you are building in the water table, then we're going to do the seams a little bit differently. Um, heat fusing is the most acceptable if we're building in the water table because it's probably the best watertight seal. But if heat fusing isn't an option, we will reinforce those seams with a liquid membrane and then reinforcing fabric embedded into the liquid membrane within inches on either side of the seams. So kind of like a, I like to use the analogy of like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. We would put that membrane inside the liquid membrane and then push them together. Um, these are the weak points that we need to do uh, that we have to do that work to ensure that the, the liquid water is going to is not going to move past the membrane. Um, in the water table, heat fusing and embedded fabric reinforcement are two of the best options. With the transitions, we've been talking a lot about the vertical plane when we mentioned like the bathtub. Um, those scenes can become very tricky when we're moving from vertical to horizontal. So the way that we deal with that is by making the angle a little less steep. So that it flows a little bit easier and we can make liquid components, tapes, or flexible sheets to make that angle a little bit easier and to not put so much pressure on the membrane. Um, we do need to reinforce that area because that's going to be another one of those weak points that we need to watch out for. Fluid applied. So with the fluid applied membranes, we're hanging geotextile fabric or attaching it to the drainage board, and then we are spraying an asphaltic emulsion on top of that textile, geotextile to saturate it and then create a durable seamless membrane. This is a little more dependent on the applicator ability because we need to make sure that the thickness is correct and that all of those, that the fabric is saturated correctly. But the benefit of not having seams is also the reason why this is a pretty great membrane for waterproofing. Bonding with this adhesion or the mechanical bond is completely different how the fluid applied membranes bond to the concrete after the concrete is poured. It starts the curing process. And then the concrete cure actually generates heat that will soften the surface of the emulsion liquid. It will then reliquify in a sense and then attach itself to the concrete. Then we have our betonite. So betonite is a naturally occurring product that is clay and it has the potential to swell up times its size as it absorbs the water and as it is hydrated. The betonite is actually an incredibly effective waterproofing product, but it relies on compression and hydration. So as the, bet the betonite actually absorbs water, it turns into a waterproofing gel. And as long as it remains under compression, then it will protect our structure from additional water because it will absorb all of the water. But unfortunately, betonite is not vapor-proof material on its own, and it is not a very structured material. So as it turns into a gel, it kind of loses its structure um, bed night is usually going to be combined with an asphaltic basing or, a, or, or something in between of the layers. And that geotextile, as the bed night expands, the geotextile fabric will actually hold it in place. And as the soil shifts, it will keep it together in order to keep the structures protected. Bed night systems are not fully adhered systems because they're not going to bond with the concrete. And they're just going to kind of exist outside the concrete under compression with consistent hydration. That's how they work. So basically they get wet and they swell. Bed night is the best is best used in areas where there is a constant hydration. So either in the water table or a very high water table where we have climates that we can expect a lot of ground ground or soil saturation. What we do not want to do with our night our bed night membranes is put that put them in applications where there are a lot of wet dry cycles because bed night is most effective when it is fully hydrated. So if we have a long dry spell and the clay starts to dry out, it starts to crack and then it moves within its constraints, and then we have another rain event 
that it, the constant rehydrating, dehydrating, um, at that point, our structure is vulnerable as water can move through the clay until it's at full capacity, then you know it's working because it's most effective when it's when it's fully wet. So you wanna make sure that it's always gonna be in like a wet climate. Um, so bentonite actually, it's not, it's not prematurely hydrated. So if you're expecting a bunch of rain in the next couple of weeks and you don't have enough time, or if you're not ready to pour the concrete just yet, you want to hold off because the bentonite clay, when it gets wet, it can start to swell before it's under that compression seat. And we can lose a lot of strength that stems, you know, in that system essentially. So we would need to replace it with dry bentonite at that point. We need to be very, very careful not to get the membranes wet before they're supposed to be, you know, have the concrete poured on top of them. Um, fasteners are also very important. You need to always follow the manufacturer's instructions and do not skip on fasteners. We need to make sure that these membranes are going to remain vertical during the concrete pour and that the weight of the concrete is not going to pull the membrane down. That can, that can create wrinkles, which are not great, but we can deal with them. If it pulls it even further down and we have huge sections of the wall that are unprotected, we'll have to take that concrete out, re-waterproof and re-repair, and that's a very expensive situation to correct. So make sure that your correct, correct fasteners are being used and make sure they are sealed. When we're detailing penetration, this is also very, very important because this is another weak spot. Um, we are talking, you know, vertical pipe penetrations. The hardest part about detailing these types of membranes is catching all of the penetrations. So we need to use a liquid membrane or a masse with a piece of the membrane and then install the sheet membrane on top of it to make sure that those are fully sealed. We also have our tie backs. Uh, two ways of de dealing with tie backs. We can completely cover it in a liquid membrane. Another option is we can build up a cover for the tie back using different materials. And then we will cover it up with a liquid membrane embedded in a reinforcing fabric, excuse me, fabric into the liquid membrane. And then we can very smoothly place the waterproofing membrane over that whole entire section. So after membrane insulation, this is, I can argue this is probably one of the most important, um, is to inspect the membrane immediately prior to the pour after the rebar is installed. Because once that concrete is poured, if there are any defects or damage that we did not catch, we're not going to know about it until we have an issue. And at that point, it's very expensive to take your time. Uh, it's very expensive to repair. So we need to take our time during the inspections and making these observations. You also want to consider your patching. We need to make sure that we patch every single piece of damage or defect, even if it's small or fairly easy. Half an inch or less, we just paint over it with some liquid membrane or mastic. If it's half an inch to one inch, we're going to embed fabric into that liquid membrane just to give it a little bit more strength and durability. Anything over one inch is a little cumbersome to repair, especially after the rebar has already been installed. But it's very important that the one inch gap or one inch puncture does not end up causing millions or thousands of dollars worth of damage. So if we have a puncture that's over one inch, make sure that we cover it with liquid membrane and overlap it with a new sheet and extend six inches on either side. Again, it will depend on your system exactly and what you're supposed to, for what you're supposed to do, but you always want to make sure that you follow the manufacturer's installation guidelines. Always double check to make sure everybody on the job is trained, not just the foreman, and make sure that every single person installing this membrane has gone through training with a specific system because we need to make sure that it's done correctly the first time and we don't have any issues. We also have our underside waterproofing. Um, so far, we've talked mostly about the vertical waterproofing, but now we're going to talk about the underslab because um, the water we have to protect. You know, we have to have protection against vapor below the slab, and we want to protect against liquid water as well. So we need to protect our structure against water vapor, and we want to prevent moisture and mildew in those below grade spaces. By doing that, we need to protect the floor and all the people and objects inside as well. Water vapor is also known to debond adhesives, especially water-based adhesives. So if you think about it, if we have like a wood flooring, that wood flooring will absorb that moisture as well, and those floors will then start to buckle. So many different reasons why we need to protect against liquid water on the horizontal or under slab. So here you can actually see in this picture, um, this is a under slab that's actually going in. 
Um, you can even see the soil retention system up on the left hand side. Um, with the horizontal soil retention, many times we'll see compacted soil that is an acceptable substrate before we put down the waterproofing membrane, gravel, or drainage. But the key factor of the vertical soil retention system is that it has to be smooth and it has to be continuous. So you might see a mat slab, mud slab, or a clean slab. There's many different words for it. Um, that's where we put down a sacrificial, sacrificial layer of concrete that doesn't have any reinforcement. And it's not meant to be structural. It's just meant to provide a clean, flat, dry substrate that people can walk on where there's no mud. And then we can lay this waterproofing membrane down and, and be confident that we're not going to have any punctures. We could install the rebar for the structural slab and keep on going. But there are some instances where if we have a lot of people walking around on the site, we want to make sure that this membrane is as protected as possible. You might also see a protection slab on top of the waterproofing membrane. This protection slab is just a couple of inches on top of the membrane, and that will protect it from the job site abuse so that we don't have to worry about going in and repairing punctures. You need to know what your risk factor is. So if you're building a parking garage where it's not really occupied space and we still want to keep the water out, but you might need, not need all of this because there's not that big of a risk, it's not going to have a huge effect on the rest of the structure. But if this is a basement of a museum where you're going to have, you know, our ar archival space, um, we want to make sure that the entire below grade selection is sealed as possible. And it's going to be a little bit more expensive, but the risk of the waterproofing failing is going to create a lot more damage and expense than on the parking garage situation. So that's kind of how I like to guide people to decide, you know, what is the level of robustness and how much are they willing to spend on the system? Because what is the risk if the waterproofing fails? Are you going to be able to live with whatever's in that building getting damaged? So in conclusion, we're going to talk about some of the best practices. You want to make sure you follow your manufacturer's instructions. If they're going to recommend certain accessories, you want to use those accessories and always single source whenever you can, because those membranes come as a system. They're intended to work as a system. And if you use the accessories from one manufacturer, for that one system, but then use someone else's, you're actually cutting down the potential of the compat or you're actually bumping up the potential work compatibility issues. Um, you will also be very certain that you're not jeopardizing your warranty in any way by doing this. The pre installation meetings are also key. I know it can be a little difficult to get everybody in the same room together, but it's better to be sitting there talking about the stuff around a table than sitting on the job site trying to figure out, okay, where did we go wrong? What, what do we need to do here? Um, I've been in situations like that myself, and it's not a fun time. You also want to try to figure out what details need to be reinforced. How are we going to handle the terminations? How are we going to detail the tie back? All of these are tricky parts that need to be discussed ahead of time with the manufacturer, the installer, and the general contractor. And everyone who is going to potentially touch this membrane needs to be involved in the pre-installation meeting. And then I might be a little biased on this one, but please involve your manufacturer as much as you can. We know these systems very well. We know what works with our products and we know which situations different products will excel in and when you might need to be use a more robust system. So bring us to bring us into it on all stages of the project and all phases of the design. Um, we would like to be a part of the pre installation meeting. We want to be available for the job site observations and to ensure that everything being in, everything is being installed correctly. So please don't hesitate to reach out to your manufacturer as I promise they truly want to be involved. And that is the end of our presentation. I want to thank you guys for joining me. Um, if you are in the state of Florida, you can contact me at tcarter at wrmeadows.com. You can also reach me on my work cell phone, which is 407-663-4013. And as Isaac said earlier, if you are not in the state of Florida, you can still contact me and I'll point you in the right direction. But if you are not in the state of Florida, please reach out to us at info at wrmeadows.com. Um, if there are any questions inside the chat box, I think Isaac's going to hop back on here and see if there's anything that we can answer. If there's something that needs a more thorough answer, we will reach out to you via email. Thank you again, guys. I really appreciate you joining me today.